This week on the Energy Savers, Active Solar Energy. Welcome to the Energy Savers. I'm Jacob Quinlog, your host. If we were to consider a plan to convert a major portion of our energy demand to solar sources in the near future, a large part of that plan would consist of the use of active solar energy collection systems. The heating and cooling of many existing buildings, as well as the generation of electricity from the sun, could only be realized by the use of some active solar device. There are many types of active systems in use or being proposed for development at this time. In this program, we will discuss some of these systems, explain how they work, and give you some idea of the cost of converting your home to an active solar energy system. Our guest today to discuss active systems is Dr. Donald Spencer, who's an associate professor of energy engineering at the University of Iowa. Welcome, Dr. Spencer. Thank you. Uh, could you give us an overview of the components of an active solar system and just how the system works? Yes, uh, an active solar system uh, is differentiated from a passive system in that you move a fluid through a region, a hot region provided by the solar energy, solar rays from the sun, you move this fluid down into your house to heat your house or to store it there. Whereas a passive solar system uh, receives the energy directly into the space without any moving fluid in a sense, without any motors. Uh, we see here uh, the components of an active solar system, a, an absorber plate, which is the basic feature the absorber plate is in the sun, it's exposed to the sun, and gets warmer and warmer and warmer until finally it reaches a temperature such that it can heat the space or can store the energy necessary to heat the space. And then you then circulate a liquid or a gas through this absorber. In this case, we see uh, a tube and fin absorber plate. The tubes could be closer together or they could be connected to form a, a rectangular passage for the flow of liquid or for the flow of air. So we would have an air type or a liquid type. The liquid types could be water or other types of liquids. What about storage in a system like uh, this? Yes, well, uh, a natural storage uh, device for liquid systems is water. It's cheap and has a very high uh, specific heat capacity for storage. Uh, the storage is needed because the sun doesn't shine at night. It doesn't shine on cloudy days. Uh, so you attempt then to build up a reserve of energy uh, for these occasions. Uh, rocks are very good for air type collectors. Rocks can be used also as a heat exchange device. You circulate the air from the uh, collector through the rocks to store energy in the rocks. Then you circulate the air from your house through the rocks to heat the house. Um, this is an example of an existing house that has a south-facing roof of approximately the right slope, and therefore the roof itself can be used to support the solar collector. And so it's an ideal case of what we call retrofit. When you talk about retrofit, exactly what do you mean? Taking an old house, an existing house, and putting a solar collector on it rather than integrating it into a new, a new structure. I see. You also mentioned uh, the angle of tilt. Uh, just what is the optimum angle that a collector should sit at? Right. The optimum angle depends on the use pattern for the solar system. If you're going to use the, the solar system throughout the year, as in domestic hot water heating, then the angle should be equal to the latitude, the slope angle. In other words, the latitude here is about 41 degrees, so the collector should be tilted up from the hori horizon 41 degrees. And this gets the best angle. Now, if you're only going to use it in the wintertime, such as heating your home only, then a steeper angle is required, maybe 55 or 60 degrees. I see. Or even vertical. This is an example of an active system uh, in which uh, the liquid flows in a corrugated channels over the absorber. And the absorber is heated, conducts the heat to the liquid in these channels, and is carried away. And it's, there is a glass cover, of course, and back insulation to protect the uh, system. Now, the special features of this are simplicity and low cost and site-built. This is basically a site-built collector, and uh, this uh, gives us, you know, reduced cost. This is a, an example of a collector that's 
obviously perched up there on the roof requiring extra materials over what is normally needed for a rather steeper roof. So the cost is accordingly somewhat higher. Uh, it appears to be, you see, modules, prefabricated modules uh, placed on the roof. What would be the alternative to using this type of idea? Uh, the site built can be used in retrofit as well as in new construction, but the module has more of an application in retrofit than otherwise. Uh, so I think the basic uh, concept of an individual module, an individual module has an appropriate place in retrofit. This is another example of retrofit in which the roof has been modified by a, a truss, a truss to give us the proper tilt angle and uh, the truss then has been faced with plywood and a collector applied as in new construction. Uh, this is a liquid type collector used for direct heating of the space. This is an example of a site built air type collector. Uh, you can see the pitch is 55 degrees approximately. It appears that the living space behind it can be utilized so that the insulation that must be there to protect the absorber is also insulating the house itself. And uh, we see a, a lightweight uh, cover going on there which will be resistant to rocks and hail and not overweight the roof and cause need, you know, require extra support. Here we have two modules or four modules attached to the southern wall of a small building there. This shows that you can use those on the end of your structure as well as on the roof uh, and even in a rather crowded residential area. The shading, as you see, is, is not a, a factor, although it frequently is. Now, this is an example of a liquid type collector used as source heat for a heat pump. Uh, we have here a solar collector that's built into a new construction. The ins insulation is part of the wall insulation so that the only added thing there is the absorber plate for the two modules that are on the house itself. Uh, actually, uh, the heat pump approach is a little expensive. It's been shown that if you're going to go to the trouble to use solar, it's better to use the thermal energy directly rather than through the heat pump. But so this was a heat pump application. In this case, the water goes into storage and then a heat pump delivers it to the house? The heat pump then extracts the heat from the storage and delivers it to the house as a conventional heat pump does except it extracts heat from the air. Is this on a fairly large commercial building? Yes, it's a commercial building, and it's appropriate to use liquid systems in commercial buildings. Air is a little bit difficult to use. Why is that? Well, it's basically the sizing of the ducts and the pumping power that's needed for air. Uh, but this also uses the heat pump uh, concept. And if your building is heated with high temperature steam, the flat plate is not going to do it. It uh, loses energy in accordance with its area, you see. So if you compress that area down and focus the energy on that area, you lose less energy, and therefore you get higher temperatures. And this is a focusing collector here of that type, used to generate steam, actually. So the collectors actually focus on right. the sun and concentrate the energy. They concentrate the energy on a small area, and therefore the loss is small, relatively. Let's talk a little bit about the economics of a solar, active solar system. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk that they're fairly expensive and, and aren't competitive with conventional fossil fuels. Is that true? Well, most active solar systems are not competitive and they're very expensive. Why is that? Well, basically, when uh, the solar movement uh, really began, there was a tremendous inertia to construct these modules in central factories and ship them out for installation. And it turns out when you do that, you get them out to the site, and the cost to install them is really excessive, almost as much or perhaps a little more than the cost of the modules themselves. It turns out also that the modules, if pre-constructed or fabricated, require twice to three times as much materials as if you do it on a site-built basis. So whereas you tried to save labor and tried to save material, by central fabrication, you lost on both counts. And so you end up with a price about three times what it should be. What are we talking about for that We're price? We're talking about 40 to $60 a square foot or something like the cost of the house. It's really incredible. 
let's say, 30 to 60. What would be your alternative solution to that problem? Well, the alternative solution would be to design integrated systems which would go into the new construction. You see, we would emphasize the cost-effective aspects of new construction, reduce the materials by a factor of one-third, uh, and uh, then as we hone this down for new construction, then we modify it as necessary for retrofit or for existing buildings. Uh, it's terribly important to do them on existing buildings. But it's not important to start out with the most cost, uh, costly approach first. But that is what has been done. So we have to back up now, and we have to you know, do a lot of re-education. So what you're, you're talking about is using manufactured components in a site-built situation. Manufactured and highly uh, finished in terms of the work that can be done in the, in the shop or on the ground, but certainly not, you know, the work on the roof is very difficult. But you keep that to a minimum, just as you put on sheet rock, you know, rather rapidly. You should put on these absorber panels rather rapidly and simply on the roof. I see. Or on the wall. What would you think the, the expected cost difference would be for a system built like you're proposing? Well, I think a system should be uh, cost in the range of 7 to $10 a square foot versus, you know, say, 20 to 30 for really fairly good modular uh, collectors. So there's a significant difference. A factor of three, roughly. Is the glazing much of a consideration? I mean, sh should you use glass as opposed to fiberglass or vice versa? Well, there's a big inertia, you know. People really like glass and they want to use glass, but glass is very heavy. You have to support your roof with added beams. Uh, it's uh, also uh, more expensive to, to put on, more expensive to, uh, to uh, seal around the edges and requires more framework. No, I think in the long run, we're going to have to come down to using uh, plastic-like materials, but it's still very good materials. Polyester-filled fiberglass is an example. It's available from several uh, companies. It's very high in transmission, not as good as glass, but still very good and very light and resistant to impact of rocks and hail. And Is the uh, life expectancy of these plastics uh, anywhere near that of glass? Yes, well, uh, glass, I guess, doesn't ever go too far, you know, in, in terms of uh, transmission, and I think we can expect 20 years from uh, these uh, light uh, materials. I see. Uh, they have good UV shields, that is, uh, the ultraviolet <laughs> tends to deteriorate many plastics, but the companies have devised ways of shielding this uh, from the, uh, the ultraviolet. We've talked a lot about uh, solar heating and cooling systems. Uh, what about solar electric cells? What's the current state of the development of these? Mm -hmm. Well, when the sun shines on a uh, flat plate collector, it gets the collector hot, and we collect thermal energy from that. When it shines on a uh, solar electric cell, uh, the cell gets hot, but also we get electricity uh, from it. Uh, so we get electricity directly from sunshine. Uh, the concept is beautiful. Uh, there's no moving parts. Uh, it's ideal, except for cost. Uh, presently, the cost is quite high. Hopefully, the cost will come down. The expectations are that the cost will come down. Presently, if you would like to uh, run a 100-watt light bulb for eight hours a day, uh, the investment required to do this, and still it would only run on clear days, would be something like $5,000 for uh, equipment only. So it's quite expensive, uh, really out of the question for, for anyone, uh, perhaps three times as expensive as wind energy and maybe 10 times as expensive as conventional, say, fossil fuel-powered electric. Are there any uh, breakthroughs uh, pending in this area that you know Well, of? I've heard of some breakthroughs uh, from Texas Instruments. Uh, I haven't heard any details of how this is coming about nor what the cost implications are. Thank you, Dr. Spencer. Field reporter Marty Brown recently inspected an active solar installation to see firsthand how an active solar system works. Marty? <laughs> When Don and Marilyn Eichner began building their home two years ago, they decided to use the sun's energy for winter heating. They purchased prefabricated collector modules and a water source heat pump to transfer the heat from the sun to their home. Don, why did you decide to go with an active solar system? Yeah, basically, we. Uh have gone with an active solar system because of the 
uh, structure of the house itself. It's a geodesic dome structure and it does not lend itself to uh, any other type of solar system, say specifically passive, so we decided to go with an active. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do the collectors function to uh, capture the sun's heat and transfer it to the home? Okay, now we're, we're basically using what I would call a solar assisted heat pump system. And the collectors, which you can see up here on the uh, back of the garage, uh, heat water and transfer that water to a large uh, underground storage tank and transfer the energy to that under underground storage tank through a heat exchanger. Uh, then we take the energy from the storage tank out and uh, return it to the house using a water source heat pump. Who should consider using a system like this for home heating? Okay, you really should only sh you really should only consider using a, an active solar system if you're in a location where you uh, do not have, say, natural gas available. If, you're, if your choices are propane or fuel oil or electric, then uh, you could consider using an active solar system. But if natural gas was available, you probably shouldn't consider it at all because of the cost. So you're talking purely economics here? Yes. Uh, at present, uh, natural gas uh, is so inexpensive compared to any of the other forms of energy available that it, it's not practical to consider it. Can, can the average homeowner uh, put together a system by himself like you did? I guess it would depend on uh, how uh, handy the, uh, the person actually was and how much uh, knowledge he had in the area of uh, plumbing or electrical wiring. Uh, I think I would recommend that the actual system be designed by someone uh, professional in the area in terms of sizing it to your individual uh, application. It's uh, fairly critical, particularly on a water source heat pump application. They have to be sized properly for the house. I see. Maybe we could take a look at uh, how the rest of the system operates. Okay. These are the uh, pipes that come in from the collectors on the outside. We're down in the basement presently. And the uh, fluid that flows through the collectors comes down this particular pipe, uh, <clears throat> flows down into this large tank through a heat exchanger, and then back up through this pipe into a uh, circulating pump in the other room. If you uh, would feel this particular pipe and this one, you'd notice there's about a 40 degree temperature differential because it's operating presently. Okay, the heat <clears throat> that flows, uh, flows through this particular pipe and back in through the pump then is transferred to this large underground storage tank. This is a uh, poured concrete tank. Uh, it's uh, about 10 feet deep, roughly 12 by 12, with 8 inches of styrofoam insulation on the outside and holds about 12,000 gallons of water. Uh, <clears throat> this is the water that we use to store the energy that the heat pump takes the uh, uh, heat out of that is later transferred to the house. Uh, this is the uh, pump that is used to pull the water out of the uh, storage tank and pump it through the uh, heat pump. It's a conventional centrifugal type uh, pump and we pump it through the uh, heat pump at about six to eight gallons per minute. This is the uh, heat pump, which is really the heart of the uh, solar assisted system. It's a carrier water to air source heat pump. The air, return air from the house comes down this duct through a heat exchanger, which is in this particular area, through a blower and back up to the house by the standard uh, duct work. There also, <clears throat> sitting on top of the heat pump is a small backup uh, electric strip heat unit, which will provide uh, backup heat in case of uh, uh, failure of some other portion of the system or lack of sun for a number of days. This is the uh, solar circulating pump which actually uh, pumps the fluid from the, uh, through the solar collectors and back to the large underground storage tank. Uh, above that solar circulating pump is a, an expansion tank which is necessary to uh, allow for the uh, normal expansion and contraction of the water in the closed loop system. And then above that is the differential uh, control unit which actually measures the temperature at the solar collectors and the temperature in the storage tank and when the differential is about 20 degrees the, the solar circulating pump is turned on. Uh, I guess I should also point out that this is not only a, a heating system but it also will air condition. A uh, heat pump you can reverse it and it will go into an air conditioning mode and for example now during this summer when the thing is air conditioning mode we actually take the heat from the house dump it back into this tank and we actually end up recovering that later in the year. Instead of just dumping it to the outside, we can store it uh, for the remainder of the summer. Are there things that you would do differently if you were to do it over again? Uh, oh, yeah, there's probably a couple of things I would change. Um, 
I would probably go to a different type of um, solar collector. We're using individual collector modules with their copper plates with the glass uh, covering, uh, which are fairly expensive on a per unit basis. There is now some uh, <clears throat> plastic uh, type collectors made out of an EDPM material, which is much lower on a cost per square foot basis, and I, I'm sure that I would switch over to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I may uh, have added another system of a small storage tank within this one to allow me to heat up to a water of a smaller volume to a higher temperature and try to heat the house directly with the hot water. Rather than um, using a heat pump? Yes, I would still maintain the heat pump, but for some periods of time I could use just direct solar heating. I see. 12,000 gallons of water is a little uh, too much water to try to get up to 130 to 150 degrees. I see. How much of your heating do you estimate is coming from the solar component? Uh, about 80%. Uh, you know, when I say 80%, it means that we can heat our house 80% uh, of the time with no backup heat. Uh, this house does have a backup heating system. It's an electric strip heat. And I don't believe that we'll need it any more than 20% of the time and probably not that much. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks a lot, Don. Okay. Thank you. This home was designed and built by its owner, Reese Christensen of Ames, Iowa. It combines an active solar heating system with a passive solar sun space to provide the heat needed for the home. Reese, your active system doesn't use a heat transfer liquid, so how do you move the heat out of the collectors? We're using air as a transfer medium as opposed to liquid, and the advantage of that, of course, would be that it doesn't freeze, and also the home has a forced air furnace, so we can combine the solar system with the forced air furnace easily because air is the medium. Uh, the disadvantage would be that air is not as good a heat transfer medium as water. Now, how does the uh, air move through the collectors? Uh, the air is introduced at the bottom of the collector array. It is then heated and rises naturally to the top. Running across the top of the collector, we have a horizontal duct with the main truck trunk that connects to that, goes all the way to the basement, and there's a fan connected to that and it'll pull the warm air from the top of the collectors down into the basement. From there, it can be either blown to the house or blown into storage for retrieval later. And what kind of storage system do you have? We have a phase change material, eutectic salt, which melts at 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And the air blows over the salt? Yeah, the salt is contained in thin plastic trays, and we have 1,400 of these trays stacked up in an insulated storage room, and then the air blows through the trays. I see. Now, how, how long can you store heat in, those, in the salt? Uh, what we found here, it will last about one day. I see. You can store enough heat for a typical winter day. Mm -hmm. uh, how do the uh, passive and the active components of the house work together uh, to provide the heat? Uh, they, they really don't. They're two separate systems. Uh, the active system is tied in with the forced air furnace in the house. Uh, the passive system is simply that. It's passive. It's not uh, tied in with any of the other heating functions of the active or the backup furnace. Mm -hmm. uh, the sun simply shines in the south-facing windows, and we open the, like the patio door behind this sun space here and the kitchen window and just let the heat come into the house. I see. So this is uh, uh, like a greenhouse space that we have here under your active system? Right. right. And in addition, we have the other uh, south-facing windows, which all uh, allow for passive solar gain. Right. Typically, the house will stay warm until 9, 10 o'clock at night, simply because of the heat gain through this passive glass. And then at 9 or 10 at night, then the active system would come into play, releasing the heat from storage to heat the house. If you were to do this, uh, this kind of project over again, um, would you do it about the same way? What has been your, your experience uh, with the, this combined solar? Um, I guess the, the passive is, is attractive to me uh, because it's low cost and, there, and there's no mechanics to it, really. I think for new construction, uh, insulating the house well and putting the glass on the south and building mass into the house, it, it's an economical and an easy thing to do. Um, there is a place for the active system for heating hot water or providing backup in addition to the passive. Mm 
aspect to the well-insulated house. Reese, what do you see as the, the role for, uh, for passive solar energy versus solar, uh, active solar energy? There are a lot of people who, who uh, seem to be uh, polarized in, into two camps. And uh, do you think that, the, that passive and active should be used together more uh, like you did here? Yes, I, I think there's a lot of promise for both the passive and the active. And I don't like to see people promoting one or the other and excluding the other totally because I think that, that our energy needs are such that we need to promote both of them and use both of them extensively. They both have their place and I think we need to continue to research and build and use both passive and active systems. Great. Well, thanks for sh sharing your experiences with us, Reese. It's fine. Back to you, Jacob. We're back in the studio with Dr. Donald Spencer. Doctor, one last question. Uh, what does the future hold for active solar systems as you see it? Well, the concept of mass production in centralized facilities is deeply embedded in our, in our uh, culture. Uh, but we don't do this with all kinds of products, including, for example, the home. This is not mass produced, although they've tried it. So I think we're going to overcome this, uh, this hurdle and realize that solar collectors uh, should be site built, they should be manufactured locally by small enterprises and uh, thus reduce the cost to uh, a level that uh, will be, you know, something that everyone will want to take advantage of. I think that uh, we will begin to view the exterior shell of a building as, you know, one of its functions is to collect energy for heating that building as a normal con kind of consideration as well as keeping out the wind and the cold and the rain. So uh, I, I have this uh, feeling that uh, we're going to move ahead with a kind of decentralized, site-built kind of approach. Do you see a trend uh, moving towards that di direction now? Yes, I do. I see uh, many, uh, many, in many areas, many places, uh, this kind of approach uh, being, uh, being mentioned, whereas for several years ago, it was, it was not even really considered seriously. It was always considered to be labor-intensive which is quite the opposite, you know. Thank you, Dr. Spencer. If you'd like more information on active solar systems and how they can work for you, contact the National Solar Heating and Cooling Information Center. Their toll-free number is 800-523-2929. Thank you for joining us. I hope you can be with us next week when we will conclude our series with a discussion of alternative energy applications for agriculture on the Energy Savers. Energy Savers was made possible in part by a grant from the South Dakota Energy Office.